Okay, so I wanted to make a video and show you this vehicle in particular because of its interesting situation. Uh, it was brought to me for a valve cover gasket leak that was recommended to him by another shop and he wanted me to perform that service for him. Seems pretty simple enough. Told him yes, I can do it. Once I removed the valve cover, there was something I did not expect to see, but I will get back to that here shortly. What I want to show you is where I'm at with this vehicle right now, and I'm going to get you a shot of it running. It is a 2010 A5 with a 2.0 four-cylinder turbo. Before I turn the camera on, I just, to start fresh and clean, and I cleared the trouble codes, and I want to show you guys how this is running. I'm not sure if you can pick it up, but there is the check engine light flashing. running pretty bad. And okay, so we've got trouble code misfire cylinders one and three obviously here at idle. So as you can see, after showing you how it idles, we currently have two cylinders that are misfiring. And I am going to show you a relative compression and also try to explain to you as to why we have two cylinders misfiring. I'll tell you right off the bat, it's not ignition related and we have one cylinder that is bad. But why do we have two cylinders misfiring at idle? I will hopefully be able to explain that after this relative compression waveform. Okay guys, so here is the capture for the relative compression. And this is what it looks like. We can see quite a few anomalies, so we'll break this down one by one. First of all, our channels, green is intake, blue is relative compression, red is ignition sink coil number one. Right off the bat, we'll start with relative compression. We have zero compression being built up in the number one portion. So we have a dead hole for cylinder number one. It's one, three, four, two, back to one. Intake trace. We also have anomalies that are reoccurring. If you can tell, they are occurring also when number one is at top dead center. Now the piston is traveling up, but if you can tell, this is a rise in pressure in the intake manifold. The piston is pushing pressure, compression pressure, into the intake manifold. That's what's causing that rise of pressure in the manifold. You can tell that there is an attempt to pull vacuum there, but the high pressure from the cylinder overcomes that in this waveform and pattern and what's going on in the in manifold, and it, it raises the pressure. So the only way for that to occur is for an intake valve to not seal or be stuck open. Now here I have some rulers set up, and it's broken down in four. This is top dead center for cylinder 3, 4, 2, and back to where 1 is. As far as the intake pulls, this is the intake pull for cylinder number 1. In order to find that, you take the one that you're synced on, you go to your 360 mark, and it's to the right of that is going to be the pull for the one you're synced on. So, this pull we know we have a pull going on is for this cylinder 
number one. It's an intake portion here. The next one in line, firing order, would be cylinder number three. And it starts to pull, but it, again, it's overcome with high pressure. Because cylinder number three can't breathe or ingest and pull what it should, and the, the air is now being interfered with for that cylinder's intake stroke, that's the reason why cylinder number three is misfiring. That is why we have two cylinders misfiring when we only have one dead hole. So if you think about that, if you were going off scan data and swaptronics and stuff, if you saw cylinder one, cylinder three, you'd be basically chasing your tail with number three if you weren't able to break it down or see this. I mean, seeing it this way gives us a clear indication as to why cylinder three is logging a misfire. And it, the, <laughs> the problem number three is that it doesn't have a problem. It's just, it, it's time when it's supposed to be breathing and breathing its own good amount of air is being interrupted and messed up and it can't ingest properly because of the high pressure at that point from cylinder number one. So prior to getting the vehicle in this state, this is when I pulled the vehicle in, removed the valve cover, and this is what I discovered. This is a lifter, and you can tell the ball section of it is, is broken off. These are rockers, and this piece here is broken off of that one. And the, this whole section is broken off of that. This one was the exhaust. This was for the exhaust. And this was the intake. And the ball on the intake lifter uh, was actually intact and, and still there. But these rockers were just, they had fallen off. They weren't in place anymore and just laying in the cylinder head. I was surprised to find that when I pulled the valve cover because the way the vehicle ran, I drove it around the block quick before pulling it in just to make sure nothing nothing odd was going on, nothing crazy. And to my surprise, you know, this is what was there. But I didn't notice anything. Yes, I didn't get get it under heavy load. I just went around the block. I wasn't expecting to find anything because I, I wasn't told anything either by the customer as far as drivability. And when I pulled it in and idled, it, it, it idled fine with, with nothing that would concern me or stand out being that i saw this i had a spare cylinder head with good rockers and lifters so i thought i would be helping the customer and do a good deed and i installed the good rockers and lifters and got the vehicle back up and running and this is what i ended up with a vehicle that ran worse than what it came in with and not only with one cylinder misfiring but with cylinder three misfiring so I was very confused at that point but after get, getting this relative compression that told me the story we have a physical condition now that is making it not run right and what I can tell you as far as on the intake side is that now when the Lobe came around and opened that valve with the rocker. It pushed that valve and the stem down past a certain point that either the, the stem portion is bent or is scored or something. Uh, something occurred in that valve when the damage happened that it's keeping it from seating back. It's basically stuck open. As far as the exhaust, I'm not 100% sure if it's stuck open or not. Initially, I th was thinking that it could be because even if one intake valve was stuck open, you have a second one closed, and when the piston goes up, you would think you'd, you'd have some restriction from the second valve that's closed, and you would build some sort of 
pressure here and see a small hump. We're getting absolutely zero attempts or zero pressure being built. And so I was thinking that maybe the same thing happened on the exhaust valve. When it got pushed open, it maybe hit its bad spot and stayed stuck open because now that would give us two opened valves for compression to bleed out of not just one but now two and then give us this completely zero increase in pressure. Now that might still be true but at that point when you look at cylinder one it has an intake pull. Of course it's going to have a pull because we have one valve that's staying open all the time so when it's supposed to open it's already going to be open and then the second one with the cam load now coming around for that one will open that second intake valve so you have two valves opening and you'll have a pull as the piston travels down after 360 but I don't know if you would see a pull that is equal to or similar to another one if you have a stuck open exhaust valve because that stuck open exhaust valve would kind of give you a a leak which then would make you would think would make this not pull as much as the neighboring cylinders so I don't know I don't know if it's exhaust valve is stuck open just a bit where it still creates enough of restriction to create a vacuum or it's stuck open a lot where it doesn't build any pressure here or helps in not building any pressure but somehow the piston traveling down is still strong enough to is still creating a strong enough pull to see to create this pull I don't know I can't fully answer that so I'm just not 100% sure at this point with what state the exhaust valve is in. Now this is just another quick uh, capture that I got. This is with the engine in its faulted state. This is actually at idle. And you see the same thing again. I'm synced on number one and here is your intake trace and that high pressure built up that reoccurs repetitively is obviously there so again here a little zoomed in you can see where this is a pull for cylinder one and basically very very minimal change right there as an attempt of a pull but there's too much high positive pressure being put into the intake manifold and that again as stated before is the misfiring cause for cylinder number three it's just an innocent bystander at that time so after experiencing that bad running engine I basically just took the valve cover off and removed the good rockers that I put in place of those bad valves and I started the vehicle let it run and it did actually get back to its normal seemingly good state whichever you want to call it but because of that and the way that this happened for me was that now I have the opportunity to scope and get information from an engine with a cylinder that has one out of two intake valves opening and one of two exhaust valves opening and I gathered some of this data because I was curious and I will explain what I found. First, we'll look at cranking in cylinder with intake pulls for both of them. Um, both meaning cylinder one, which I know is bad, and I'll do a known good and I picked cylinder number two as the baseline to compare number one with. As far as my channel setup, green here is intake the yellow gold is going to be in cylinder and um, red is ignition number one. First we'll look at the intake pulls since we know that one cylinder is only pulling with one valve so let's see if we can find anything 
And if you were to look at that, and from any of the ones that I've looked at, that doesn't look like an abnormal pattern. I probably wouldn't say that I see anything too crazy. So what we will look at next is comparing the two in-cylinder waveform patterns for both cylinders. And we will start with the top of the compression. And this is in voltage, so we're not getting exact pressure reading, but the voltage is good enough to compare. So this one for cylinder 2 is 2.155, and it's across all of them during the cranking event. Compared to, this is now cylinder 1, it is 2.128. So it's, it's during cranking, it's very, very minimally different between the two. And I don't even know if you'd be able to, and I don't think that would be a big enough difference to be able to uh, tell if you were to use a conventional gauge. So that's another sign that um, is not standing out with only one valve both on the intake and exhaust on the bad cylinder where it's, it's just not making the difference yet. So where we will move to next in analyzing is down here in the bottom section and compare the two. Okay, so we'll start here with cylinder number two, which is our known good, and next look at cylinder one. Now if you look closely, look at this section here. This is the intake portion of each cylinder. And this V here, look at where it lines up pretty much at that point compared to this bad cylinder. This is way deeper than this uh, stabilized point. So there is our first type of any data that is showing us a difference now. And if we take a measurement here from 360 over to where that change in pressure occurred we are getting about 28 and a half degrees switch over to cylinder one about 31 degrees not too far I mean again minimal as far as in timing but the greater difference is going to be in the vacuum so cylinder two at that portion which almost kind of lines up with that is in millivolts 661 and obviously that's not lining up it's a deeper pull or deeper vacuum portion of 6 or 4 yeah, 650 so we have that difference there now as far as exhaust valve opening if we move these over we can check and see so cylinder 2 says 60 degrees and cylinder 1 53 so we are seeing some differences in pressure changes between the two cylinders from the conditions that they're in the only other portion that I saw that was different was this section here for when the valve closes for cylinder number one compared to cylinder number two. See how it's kind of flat here and number one has this minor little blip. That was the only thing that I noticed. I can scroll over to the next cycle and you'll see it there again compared to cylinder two which it doesn't create that small blip there. That's the only other difference other than those two pressure changes and levels. That's the only other thing that I noticed. Interesting thing though, if we mark this point with this marker here, I'll bring you up to the intake and show you something that I didn't show you earlier. If I take the intake pattern and I clean this up, I want you to take a look at 
this here. There. 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 There is a repetitive blip deal going on in that transition point, which at the same time is also where that marker is, where that cylinder one is closing its valve. So that blip that's being seen down at the bottom is also now being seen up top. And this is the only, only, only minute difference or thing that is seen on the intake pattern waveform. Now that can very, very easily be missed, which again, like I said initially, there's nothing crazy going on as far as pulls. And that's the only thing that stands out. So I just thought that that was interesting to, to see, notice, and to point out to you guys. So I quickly just wanted to show you the level that that exhaust pocket reached. This is cylinder one. In the voltage again, 638. Here's the level four. Cylinder two is 646. So cylinder one is clearly a deeper pocket than cylinder two. Now this next capture kind of relates to that last bit that I just explained. This is crank no start synced on ignition one in the red and this is the exhaust waveform and here I actually inverted it to make it easier to comprehend so I'll get rid of the original one and again there's not too too much that stands out crazy like on the intake pattern this looks something like I would normally see as a cranking exhaust pulse waveform from a known good cylinder the only thing that sort of stands out is this peak here it drops down to a little bit the lower point than the rest there you can see the difference and that portion there is deep vacuum and it's deeper vacuum than the rest and that is from when cylinder one that I'm synced in when the valve opens for cylinder one on the exhaust and that exhaust pocket that we just saw is deeper than cylinder two and so it comes up displaying here as a deeper vacuum level when that exhaust valve opened for number one because it was at a deeper uh, vacuum compared to the other one so when in some portions we are seeing data that is pointing to a difference in cylinder one but it's not as crazy in some waveforms like the intake and exhaust as you would think you would see because of only having one intake valve and one exhaust valve working. Next I want to show you a comparison of cylinder 2 at idle and cylinder number 1. We'll start off with cylinder 2 at this stabilized point and quickly just to get it out of the way we'll take a look at the intake waveform and as you can see there's not one uh, again anomaly that would stand out in this running intake pressure waveform this is at idle and we're not seeing anything that would lead us to think or, or or right away tell that there is a cylinder with only one intake valve opening next just uh, quickly point out this did max out at over 90 psi that was the range that I was in because I was interested in the bottom portion. Okay, so here again was cylinder number two. Maxing out past 90 PSI. And here is cylinder number one. Cylinder one. And we are below 75 PSI. So there's your first giveaway as far as at idle the other section is here at the bottom like I said where I wanted to concentrate you can tell from this zoomed out view that there is differences between the two particularly there okay so we'll start off with cylinder number two the known good 
And obviously the big thing that stands out is this guy here. It's a pressure rise. So as far as in-cylinder pressure waveform goes, here is where the piston goes up, build compression, top dead center, then the compression stroke, and back again at 720. Exhaust valve open. Exhaust valve close. Here, this is your exhaust stroke. Here's your intake stroke. There's the pull and intake valve close. We'll start off with measuring that high point there. It's 6.8 psi. Next, this low point there. That is negative six and a half. And the difference between the two is 13.2 psi. Now, if we do the same here. This one here is at four and a half. This one here is at uh, negative eight. The difference is still pretty close, but the levels at which they're at is where we're seeing the difference clearly. Next, pay attention to this section here. See how that occurs before the 180 as opposed to this one. This is cylinder one, so there's another difference there. And this is cylinder two here compared to one. There's It's a little bit of a difference, but I wouldn't say nothing too crazy. So now I'll start in trying to explain this high portion. As far as the point in time when that pressure starts to rise is at about 44 degrees compared to Cylinder 1 to about 42, so not much of a difference. The time pretty much the same. And now we will go over and compare when the exhaust valve uh, appears to be opening. Cylinder 2 is at 48, and cylinder 1 is at about 38. So we're getting a greater difference in degree time from the pressure change compared to the two um, cylinder one is occurring later now to explain the reason why this level reaches up so high in positive pressure is because at this point in this section the piston is traveling upwards at that point i believe is when the exhaust valve closes that is gives us that sharp rise in pressure because it's almost like a compression stroke when both valves are closed, pistons traveling up, pressure rises. But the reason why this one's higher is because of this section here. You see the difference? Now the difference, what I'm measuring here is this point from where that pressure went up. And this measuring point here when the piston changed direction and started to go up and where that pressure was. Here's that portion again on cylinder number one. There is a big difference there between the two. To give you an idea numbers wise, the difference between the two is uh, on this one about 2 psi and the difference here is just over 4 psi now that's the total difference from both of these lines now just like compression pressure the higher positive pressure will create higher pressure reading when compressed you have to look at where this point started when the piston started traveling up where we were at as far as the starting point that is the negative 954 that's pretty much close to 1.0 which is or zero atmospheric it's positive pressure it's pretty much right there compared to this starting point of piston upward travel we are at negative almost negative three so about six inches of vacuum that it's still in when the piston went up. So in time, 
even though we have a larger PSI difference, it's because we go from changing from deeper vacuum level to that positive point of PSI when that occurred. So the piston's traveling up, but it's trying to get rid of vacuum first before it clears into atmospheric positive pressure to then compress, and that is why we have lower pressure reading at this point compared to the good cylinder. Because when the piston started, this was already at a up higher positive pressure, even though we are still in a negative state, it's um, lesser negative, so higher positive pressure, and it compressed higher positive pressure for longer when that changed it rose it to that higher point so that will explain that difference and part of why this also occurred is because in time of pressure change from the exhaust valve closing created this uh, difference level cylinder to cylinder as far as the vacuum level here during the intake stroke we are at minus 6, so about 12 inches of vacuum compared to cylinder 1. We are 8.5, so 17 inches of vacuum difference there. And that is where we're getting your lower compression PSI during idle. No different than there. That's why this cylinder, because it has a deeper vacuum when it goes to compress it's compressing less positive pressure so the compression pressure is lower and just quickly I'll get you a shot of during the snap throttle so cylinder 2's reading of this identifiable point is 10 and a half psi And here is cylinder one, and that identifiable point is 15 and a half, pretty much. Now that's the total opposite of what we just saw at idle. This is snap throttle, and cylinder one, the bad one, is now flip flop and has higher pressure readings at that point compared to cylinder number two during snap throttle. Now this here what we are seeing because now we're trying to move large volume of air in and out of the engine through the cylinder through the valves. What we now are are seeing is basically a classic example of uh, exhaust restriction. We're raising the pressure there at that point because we are only pushing through one exhaust valve, not two like on this good cylinder. Now, a good place to see it is zoomed in. If you look at cylinder two, the pattern, how it, it flows this way compared to cylinder one flowing this way. This more, more even, this has more of a rise. If we now look at that measurable point, it's uh, two and a half on cylinder number two. And pretty much six PSI on cylinder one. It got to that point from what happened previously which is when the exhaust was trying to get pushed out of the cylinder, but only through one valve, which created restriction, which raises the pressure in the cylinder. And you can see it in the pattern. Here, the, the movement of air was being able to be moved, which makes it more latent and not so sharply upwards. And 
with what happened previously to that point was it reached a level that wasn't that high because there was less of a restriction because you got two exhaust valves open letting the exhaust to flow a little bit more freely out of the cylinder since this is the known good cylinder so those are the identifiable points that we are seeing as far as in cylinder pressure with a known good and the one with only one intake valve and one exhaust valve and lastly Again, this is all just to uh, satisfy my curiosity because of the unique condition that uh, we were having. I did a relative compression test with the uh, just the one valve on each, you know, on the intake and exhaust. And again, a lot of this is to see what can be seen when the engine's in that condition. And um, some might be curious what the relative compression peaks would be like. Again. Intake seems to be nothing too crazy. You, you do have that one point that I was talking about earlier. But that's only because we know of what we saw in cylinder that we were able to pick that out. But even by picking that out, we don't know that it's contributed to the fact that it's only one valve. So I don't know if that, again, would help you to depict one valve operation and here on the relative compression trace synced on one I don't even know if you'd be able to depict number one as a, a, an anomaly obviously and oddly we have cylinder three that keeps popping up as a higher compression but one is pretty close to at least the neighboring one if you zoom into this level again that's pretty much there and then the oddball guy but yeah on on relative compression i don't know if you'd be able to uh pick that out and magically say it's all due to uh, one valve opening on intake and exhaust okay so that is all that i could gather and present to you after looking it over this was definitely a unique one I was very curious as to checking and seeing what those pressure waveforms would look like, knowing that we only had one intake valve and one exhaust valve working. It was definitely cool to see, um, and I think the cooler part, or stranger part, is how little differences there was from a known good as far as intake waveforms and exhaust waveform, during cranking especially, from this one that was in its faulted state. Usually that is a good place to depict and find faulted mechanical issues. But the, the pressure differences were, were very minimal, if any, in those portions. Obviously the clue to seeing good detail and differences was to go in cylinder and compare it to a known good. And again, like, like we said, a relative compression would be one that you would do very easily. And in that one, nothing was seen either. So at the end of this, uh, the, the vehicle just stayed in that mechanical state that it was. The customer ended up taking it and was going to decide whether he wanted to do an engine and, or do a cylinder head rebuild. But at this point, that's all that I have for this one. I hope you found it interesting. It was definitely a unique one for me. I was glad to have experienced it. Not too happy about putting it together more than one time or taking it apart but that's all i could do on this one so uh, thank you for joining and watching and i hope you got something out of it